seria muito... Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call the January 8th school committee meeting to order. Uh, primary focus on the agenda tonight is the start of the uh, FY19 budget uh, discussions. Uh, we will, uh, before we get into that, we'll have if there's any public input uh, from something that's not budget related, uh, welcome to come up and do that. Yes. Thank you. Seeing no other public input, uh, we now have a consent agenda. Is there anything we'd like to remove from um, the? We need to just remove the approval of minutes from December 11th to the 18th. They'll be included in the next consent agenda. Okay. Anything else? So motion to approve the consent agenda as noted, modified with the removal of the minutes. Second. Second. All those in favor? Six zero. Great. Okay, before we start in the budget, I just wanted to uh, clarify. We uh, did need to change the night we vote uh, because of a, cit a citizen has let us know that we have missed uh, in the bylaws that we needed to have the budget for 14 days before we vote so we won't vote until uh we when do we add the that tuesday onto the, the uh, onto the schedule uh, and as i mentioned uh you know at the outset at our last meeting you know please ask your questions uh we don't want uh the uh, administration getting uh, emails with uh, you know hundreds of questions we just don't have the bandwidth to do that so that's why we have the meetings uh, so that uh, we'll stay here until all the questions are answered that's it thank you did you want to start sure thank you um, I want to thank everyone for coming this evening for our 
uh, opening night of the budget presentations. Uh, over the next several nights, we're going to be talking, we're going to be doing this a little bit differently this year. Um, so I, I think you're going to see that there's going to be a story that's, that's going along with this budget and subsequently the reconstruction budget that we're also going to be presenting to you on, on Thursday evening. Um, before I begin, um, I do want to point out the, the budget book that you did receive when you came in. Um, we have set it up a little bit differently this year. Uh, we've taken a lot of feedback from our budget liaisons and from other members of the community um, to have more of the financial information at the beginning of the budget book. Uh, I think you will see that reflected in the feedback um, that we've received. A lot of the uh, demographic information and other important information uh, that's not financial related is in the appendix. Um, and there are several appendices in, in the budget book. Uh, we've also put at the beginning of the budget book a one page, a little bit over one page, uh, uh, kind of budget highlights, which, which really breaks down piece by piece the different, the different uh, major aspects, major points of, of the budget. So um, I think you will see in the budget book, it's, uh, the beginning piece has more of the financial information, the back of the piece has more of the demographics and other data information, which is the feedback that we heard. I also want to thank uh, my entire administrative team for all of the hard work that they have put into this process. We've been working on this process since October, essentially when the financial forum started, um, and a significant amount of work has been put into this budget as it is certainly every year, and the discussions and um, the decisions that we make, which uh, you know we do with certainly what's in the best interest of kids with the resources that we have available. I also want to thank um, Gail Dowd for the tremendous amount of work that she has done putting together um, all of the information that you have in front of you this evening, <coughs> the budget book, the Munis budget, um, all of that information. I mean, clearly this has been a 24-7, 365 day um, task since October. So I, I want to thank Gail for all of her efforts. So, all the finance we got. Yeah. Thank you. So, what we want to talk about over the next few days and going into next week, we want to talk about the good news that's had going on in this district, um, as well as the financial piece, the obstacles that we're facing. But there are a lot of good things happening in this district, um, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them tonight. But you're going to hear other stories over the next couple of nights as well. Um, and so we're hoping that the stories that we tell will help connect to the types of things that we not only know that the Reading Public Schools are now, but what we want it to be. Um, you will see that on Thursday night when we present the reconstruction budget, uh, which is uh, essentially, quote unquote, the, the, the override budget um, as, we, as we move forward in this process, in that we know that we need to look at things differently. We know that we need to be able to um, restructure, you're going to hear the word restructure a lot, our resources um, in, in a way that will prepare us down the road um, for, for, future, for future, you know, fiscal situations. So I think you're going to be seeing that over the next few nights. Um, you can see it on the slide the calendar. Um, tonight we are going to be doing the three smallest cost centers after a short overview administration, the district-wide services, and the school facilities slash capital. Uh, the two largest cost centers will be on Wednesday night, regular day and special education. And then Thursday night will be a public hearing at 7 o'clock, followed by the reconstruction budget. And then on the 18th, the school committee will have a discussion. And then on the 22nd, as Chairman Robinson did, take a vote. We are essentially preparing two budgets, as I mentioned. On the 8th and the 10th, you're going to be hearing the balanced budget. And as I mentioned earlier to the staff today when we were presenting this to them um, and to the budget liaisons who we were presenting to a little while back, um, I really don't want to call this a superintendent's recommended budget this year because I would not really recommend this budget. Um, this is a balanced budget. It's not a recommended budget. It's a budget that is not in the best interest of students. And I think that's the bottom line here. Um, it is a balanced budget, though, which is something that we felt we needed to move forward with. Um, what my recommended budget would be would be what we're presenting on Thursday evening. 
which is the reconstruction budget. And that's happening on the 11th. So what has been happening in our district? There are a lot of great things going on right now. Um, at the elementary level, there's a lot of work happening in literacy and math. And uh, in grades K to five, we have a, a significant amount of work happening with our teachers and our students with writer's workshop and where students are building the fluency in writing. Um, this is the second year of the curriculum, science curriculum implementation. Um, the last two years we've been fortunate. The town meeting has given us $150,000 each year in funding. It's gone to uh, providing online interactive curriculum, materials, and technology to support that curriculum. So we are currently in the second year of that implementation. Um, I talked briefly earlier about mathematics. Um, we are focusing our training and our resources in K-2. Um, because what the research shows clearly is that children need to develop greater understanding of number concept in K-2. And that's where we're focusing our teacher training and our time and resources. A lot of that's been happening this year. At the middle school, which you've heard me talk about before, we're implementing advisory, um, and, and that, which is the, one of our social emotional um, pieces, pillars. And at, at Coolidge and Parker, they are implementing the facing <coughs> history in ourselves curriculum. Uh, at the high school and at the middle school, we, uh, we are doing some work with our teachers on the level consolidation as we're phasing that in at the high school and we've done it in math in the middle school um, and the type of training and the teaching, uh, the change in teaching practices that goes along with that, that type of effort has been, been happening. And then um, special education under the direction of, of Carolyn Wilson is been focusing uh, on the review of our language-based bridge special education programs at Parker, um, and then how we can duplicate those efforts um, in, in other areas with literacy and, and other language-based programs in the district. So when we were developing this budget, we focused on some core priorities, and I think you will see in the budget process that we come back to these priorities. And you've seen these before in our district improvement plan that we have four focus areas. Uh, closing the achievement gap, literacy, math, and social emotional learning. You just saw in previous slides how we're doing, when connecting those dots even this year. We want to keep our class sizes in K to 2 between 18 and 22 students. We do want to keep as intact the middle school interdisciplinary model, although you will see in this budget that we are actually having to change that model a little bit um, with some of the reductions that we have to propose. We want to make sure that our juniors and seniors have access to coursework because they'll be graduating in the next year or two. And certainly we want to focus our resources also on the Joshua Eaton School Improvement Plan process. So in the FY19 budget, you are going to see how does this connect. So under closing the achievement gap, you're going to see some restructuring. Restructuring of an, a, a, a current position, the literacy coach, into a position um, that's currently grant funded the data coach. You're going to see professional development training for our high school staff and our middle school staff with a, with a group called Engaging Schools and in, in how they're using that, those teaching practices to reach all students. Um, our middle school have been uh, putting in this year intervention blocks with longer instructional time. You're going to see that even more next year. Um, we restored the technology replenishment and building funds to FY17 levels. If you remember last year, we made that as a one-year cut to restore the, as part of the restoration for the seven middle school teachers. We could not do that two years in a row, so we are restoring that back to FY17 levels. And we are restoring a position that was cut over a year ago, the school business assistant position. This is at no additional cost to the budget. It's a restructured position. This position will help us improve our efficiencies in our grant reconciliation process, our Medicaid reimbursement, um, which is funding that goes back and is shared between town and schools, um, student activity accounts, revolving accounts, procurement. All of this means greater opportunity for funding dollars for our, um, our students. Under literacy, we're going to continue with the, the, the professional development for Writer's Workshop, which I mentioned earlier and the review of the reading instruction at Parker, which I also mentioned earlier, and the same with the mathematics instruction. Under social emotional learning, you're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about, in a couple nights, the school transformation grant and um, how we're using that to access more training for 
our teachers for facing history and other areas that will support um, students in social emotional learning. And then you also will see restructuring um, a couple of times in this budget, and this is a restructuring of a position that currently exists, a board certified behavior analyst um, with other expenses to get a full time position so that we can attract the best candidates possible. You'll also see in this budget that we are keeping our uh, priority of K to 2 class sizes. Uh, our kindergarten enrollment is going up next year. We know that already for a fact. It's already 30 students more than two years ago, 20 more than last year. My guess is it will go up higher. It's at 300 right now. It'll be most likely at 320 or higher because we know there are students out there who have siblings in the district right now that will be attending kindergarten. So we have had to put into this budget an additional teacher and paraeducators um, to address the class size issues. You'll also see in this budget there are no FTE reductions in K-2. to uh, End of the middle school, we are going to be restructuring the middle school model. So reductions will impact this model and I'll get into more of that in detail. Um, there are no FTE reductions at the high school in this budget. The last two years the high school has received the bulk of those reductions. Um, and then under Joshua Eaton, which is another one of our priorities, there is professional development funding in there and curriculum materials for literacy and math to continue their improvement process. And as you can see, online training through Landmark School uh, for the bridge program and regular education teachers. All of this is embedded in the FY19 budget and it connects to our priorities. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Gail and she's gonna give you a financial picture of the FY19 budget. So the approach that we are going to take this evening is we're going to start at the top level and just give a high level overview. And then as we go through, we will be diving deeper into each of the cost centers. So this portion right here is really just to sort of start at the 10,000 foot level and then we will go into each specific con cost center into each line item. So this is really just to frame it. This is a slide we had presented back in December when we did the overview of the budget process. So what we wanted to do was complete the picture to let folks know where we came out. So the numbers as we discussed that evening have changed slightly based upon discussions with the town manager and the town accountant. So the numbers are slightly different than what had been presented at the October financial forum. But these are the final bud budget numbers that we have. So we, the budget as allocated to us is the 42723000 which is a 3.2% <coughs> increase over the current budget. The non-accommodated costs are up 2.2%. The accommodated costs are up 12.1%. And just as a quick reminder, within that non-accommodated, within the accommodated cost, that reflects the decrease in the state reimbursement for circuit breaker. We know next year we have a $200,000 decrease that's funding we receive from the state that is already reflected within that number so that's one of the main reasons why that number has the increase that it has what we do when we start this process is we do what we call a level ser service budget which is a bottom-up budget where we take the existing staffing and services we currently have and bring that forward into FY19 so that's all contractual increases through any collective bargaining it's also any known contractual in increases with our transportation any of our technology items so basically anywhere where we know we have a definitive <coughs> agreement in place it reflects that this does not bring back any services that have been cut in the past this is really just keeping everything we have and moving it forward a couple of items that have been added back that we'll talk about in the next couple of slides is areas where we made cuts last year to building based budgets and technology where we said we, we were going to make one year cuts in order to restore the um, middle school teachers those we had said as we did the budget last year we would need to restore those this year so that is reflected so when we did this we had the budget deficit of 843,000, so that is the level of cuts we needed to make in the current year in order to present the balanced budget. <coughs> this here is a high level summary of the five cost centers. As we talked about in December, there were five cost centers that the school committee will be voting on. 
Tonight we will be covering administration, school facilities, and district-wide programs. On Wednesday evening we will be discussing special education and school facilities. So we will be going through each one of these in greater detail. So this is just a high-level snapshot. What we wanted to spend a couple of moments going through is what the various financial drivers that were incorporated as we built each budget. So this applies across all five cost centers. Within each one of them, we have included the salary benefit and obligations for both represented and non-represented. One area we did want to remind everyone is that last year we did a one-year contract for all of our bargaining units. We will be starting the process in the next month or so of um, negotiating new contracts with all five of our um, collective bargaining units. Also reflected is increases in regular day mandatory transportation. So that is for students in grades K through six who live more than two miles from their school. We have, we are currently, next year we will be in the third year of a five year contract. So we know what those increases will be. That impacts um, regular day mandatory transportation. And as you'll see, it also impacts athletics and extracurricular because it's all part of the same contract. As we discussed when we presented the forecast at the last school committee meeting, we have also seen increases in out of district tuition in transportation, given an increase in the number of students that are in out of district trans out of district placements. We've also seen an increase in the number of students who require specialized transportation that are part of their IEPs. So we have built that in. Regarding the $450,000 adjustment that we made last year to the budget. Part of that was we did receive $100,000 additional allocation from free cash last year that was not included as part of the budget process this year. And three of the cuts that we made, we did state were going to be one year cuts that we would need to restore in the current year. So once we go into regular day, we'll be presenting that we have restored the building based budget. So that was a $100,000 increase the district-wide technology replacement, so that's to keep up with the aging technology to replace the various laptops um, and computers. That has gone up by 50,000. We've also restored the substitute teacher line. This year, what we've been able to do, because we have not filled the literacy coach position, we have been using that to fund professional development as well as substitute teachers. So we are restoring the substitute teacher line next year. Within the athletics, we have seen increases in the transportation that we just discussed. We also, as we talked about last year, we have come off guaranteed rates for the pool and the ice, so now we are starting to see annual increases. We've worked with um, the ice arena as well as the, the Y for the pool rate, so we've worked very closely with them, but we have seen increases in the current year, but it, we've had very good conversations to try to increase slowly over time with them. We also are in the third year of the contractual cleaning. We outsourced the cleaning here at the high school, so that is a contractual increase. And also throughout many of our technology line items, we may have three year agreements that we have. So every three years you may see an increase, either we're coming into a new state contract or it's a renewal we did that is now coming up for renewal and there are also instances in which items had been covered under the capital plan as part of the first year implementation that now become part of the operating costs going forward. If I speak too quickly, please stop me. The other financial drivers, um, we talked about the circuit breaker. So historically the state has reimbursed typically between 70 to 72, 75 percent this year across all districts they are reimbursing at 65 percent so for us that was a two hundred thousand dollar decrease in that also one of our revolving accounts which is special education for students that are tuitioned into Reading in which they pay tuition to us we do have students that are moving on that will not be tuitioned in next year so we have to adjust the offset because will no longer be getting the revenue or providing services to them. The third one up there is while we did increase fees last year, we have seen, and th this is, we're two months into the year, we do want to caution people that we do not have a full year worth of student enrollment data. 
yet, so we will continue to monitor this. What we have seen in athletics is that last year we raised the fees, but we did not raise the family cap. We have also seen an increase in the number of students that qualify for free and reduced. So we are monitoring it now to look at what the full year's revenue would be, but until we actually see all the students sign up and what the actual impact of the changes would be. So based upon looking at some of the preliminary numbers, we're proposing to reduce mm -hmm. the offset next year for those two items. But we will continue to monitor it as we go through the various seasons this year. We also wanted to let everybody know instances in which in the level service budget, we've actually increased staffing. This is staffing directly tied to providing required services. So as we talked about in the last school committee update, we are adding a sub-separate classroom for the RISE preschool. We are required to provide services upon a child attaining the age of three, which we do not have control over when that happens, people moving in and out. So we are adding a sub-separate classroom over at Wood End that is starting this it already started. It started today. Um, oh, last week. <coughs> so we are having additional students that started last week. We have more students coming in in March and additional coming in in May. And we also, based upon the numbers, are expecting additional students in September. Given the needs of these students, we did have to create the sub-separate classroom. So we are adding the teacher for that. We also have to add professionals and that is twofold there are instances in which according to the students need they have a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional and then given the number of students in the classroom we needed to increase the paraprofessionals within the special education program itself we have gone through all of the students as they are progressing through the grades and through the different schools and based upon that analysis and review of students IEPs we have also added three additional paraprofessionals. As John mentioned earlier, we are also seeing an increase in the number of kindergarten students based upon the preliminary information we have. So we are adding an additional teacher and paraprofessionals to support the increase in enrollment there. Those are all included within the baseline budget, but we wanted to point these out because sometimes it does get tricky because we're adding but cutting position so we wanted to help reconcile by showing what we were adding there are a couple of items that are not included within the level service budget the first being the third year of the science curriculum the hundred and fifty thousand that was not added adding that amount would have resulted in additional personnel cuts being made so we have made the determination not to include that within the budget the other area that when Carolyn and I did the special education, when we looked at existing population of students in transportation and rolled that into next year, compared it to what the accommodated costs were, our projection is $133,000 higher than what the accommodated costs are. We do know this number changes constantly. We do know that there is always the potential that the state could increase its reimbursement rate. We will be applying for there's a mechanism where you can apply for extraordinary relief to potentially get additional funding. So we are going to exhaust all avenues we can, but we do want to base to caution that if we have additional students go out of district, we do not qualify for extraordinary relief, or the state does not increase its reimbursement, we could be in a situation where we would have to go back to town meeting to request additional funding. Again, the difficulty here was this population does change and we did not feel it was a prudent decision at this point to make additional cuts out of regular day for a number that does change throughout the year. <coughs> this is a quick snapshot of where the percentage of the budget for each call center is. <coughs> Actually show it again here. What we wanted to point out to folks is that the three smallest cost centers, the administration, school facilities, and district-wide, have remained relatively consistent over the years. We've attempted to keep them relatively self-contained. One item that you will notice is that there has been a steady shift between regular day and special education. That is an item we are very much 
aware of and we are monitoring it and we are doing looking to do everything we can to not have a shift if we can find other ways to do that but we that's where we wanted to point out on this slide and again we'll be diving into each one of these cost centers as we go this is another snapshot that we usually pull together for folks and again this is the entire budget by the various categories we'll be diving into each of them as we go through them what jumps out the most would be professional salaries that has remained relatively flat year over year the reason for that is as John discussed at the beginning the majority of the cuts that we are making are all personnel oriented within um, the, the, the teachers so that's why that caught that line item is relatively flat the clerical salaries and other salaries that is contractual increases as well as some of the other positions that we just spoke about the paraprofessionals increasing substitutes those are in those line items so that's where you see the increase there within contract services that is where mandated transportation out of district transportation the high school cleaning contract is in that so that's where the increases you were seeing there supplies and material and other expenses the main drivers there are the increase in the per pupil budgets at the schools where we said we have restored those back to the FY17 levels and out of district tuition is also included in the other expenses line item. So we'll be diving into each of these as we go through, through each cost center but high level those are the main drivers. So um, what we do now is I'm going to go through the uh, You've seen the 10,000 foot, and now we're going to start funneling down to more of the specifics. So, <coughs> as Gail mentioned, we had over $800,000 in reductions that we needed to make from the level service budget. So what you're going to see here are a list over the next few slides, um, the personnel reductions, the non-personnel reductions, um, and the restructured positions, which are cost neutral. Um, in terms of the personnel reductions, the first one, uh, all of these are under regular day. The first one is um, uh, 4.0 FTE elementary classroom teachers. This would be happening in grades three through five. It will be solely based on class sizes. Um, the impact of this will be the classes will go up as high as 27 um, students. The next one, um, the seven middle school teachers, which is something that was unfortunately part of the discussions last year. Um, I think what's important to note, this has, this has an impact in many ways. The, more, the most important impact is that we are actually changing a structure that we know has worked for students at the middle school level in this community for several years, over 30 years. The middle schools are one of our strongest pieces of our school district. If you talk to superintendents and in other school districts, their biggest concern are middle schools. We don't have those concerns for a variety of reasons. One is the structure, the schedule, the teachers, the administration, the commitment to the young adolescent. When you have all of those pieces in place, um, you have very strong middle schools that address the social, emotional, academic needs of, of all students. What we are starting to do with this reduction is we are starting to tinker with the middle school model. And we are starting to change it. Uh, so we are taking a model that's very successful and we're restructuring it. It's still going to have a middle school team concept to it, but the opportunity for students to get additional support, intervention, pull out support for special education services uh, is going to change. The ability for teachers to meet and talk about students and to plan activities together that they will work together as a team with the same students is going to change. All of those things is going to have a major impact on the middle school level. How this is breaking down is that in order to do this we had to cut a core subject out of every grade. So in sixth grade we will be reducing um, the literacy block from two periods to one. So that's an, a reduction of FTE of 3.5. At the middle school seventh and eighth grade we will be cutting out 7th and 8th grade foreign language for a net reduction of also 3.5.
So we will no longer have middle school foreign language um, if this proposal goes forward. The 2.0 FTE regular education tutors, um, these are during the school day. I think there's always some uh, misunderstanding about regular education tutors. These are not tied into any after school help or anything like that. These are, these are personnel that, that help out during the school day. Um, one of these FTEs is at the middle school. The other FTE is going to be at the elementary and it will be a reduction of hours across all five elementary schools. So every tutor will have an impact and a reduction of, of their, their hours. So that, that's where we um, go with the personnel reductions. In terms of the non-personnel reductions, one of the things we talked about earlier was the cleaning service here at the high school. So built into that cleaning services contract, there are optional cleanings that happen during vacation time. And so those vacation cleanings, we are reducing from four to two. So there'll be two vacations during the school year where we will not do the thorough cleaning that we normally would do uh, in the past. The second non-personnel reduction is under the district-wide cost center. There are a couple areas here that we're going to be reducing. One is we are eliminating the elementary after-school chorus program. Um, that's at, uh, obviously at the elementary level. At the high school level, we are going to be reducing the athletic schedule for almost all of the sports. What this means is that we will keep our league schedule and our commitment to the Middlesex League. Uh, but we will most likely be reducing non-league games um, in all sports at all levels. There will be some exceptions to this because of the fact that we do have some commitments that we have to make in terms of a minimum number of games for tournament play, uh, things like that. But on average, each, each level, each sport will see a reduction of two games, a home game and an away game, where the, where the savings is in this reduction is we will be seeing a, a savings in transportation for away games, game officials, um, expenses for home games. And then finally, the last reduction under non-personnel is virtual high school. This is an online course program that pretty much most school districts offer in Massachusetts and other states as well. Uh, this gives students the opportunity to access online courses, that, courses that we may not have available to us. Um, due to staffing constraints or that they're singleton courses. Um, we are going to be eliminating virtual high school here at, at the high school in this proposal. We are also, as I said earlier, going to be doing some restructuring of positions. Um, no additional funding is being used. These are cost neutral. So the first one, which I mentioned earlier, is the literacy coach. We currently have that position in the budget. We have been using the funds from that position this year because we weren't able to fill the position um, during the summer. Uh, we've been using that for professional development specifically for the literacy and mathematics areas that I was mentioning earlier. Next year what we are proposing is that we restructure this position into the data <coughs> coach position which is currently being funded out of the school transformation grant which um, will be expiring in the next over, in, in over a year. Uh, this is a position that is, has been working very well with teachers, administrators. She's done many presentations um, uh, in front of the school committee in using the data to help inform the changes that we need to make for our students and to, and to get to focus our resources in the areas that are most useful. The second restructured position is to restore the school business assistant which we actually cut out of the budget a, a year ago. Um, it, it, uh, it is actually a position that we should have never cut in terms of the amount of um, value that this position brings. Um, and I mentioned earlier some of the things. This person would be involved um, in making sure that we have strong grants management, our revolving accounts, uh, the Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, these are all things that, that can lead to additional revenue um, that will obviously help support the programs that we're doing in our schools. The way that we're restructuring this position, um, we are restructuring the high school secretary position, um, some additional administrative cost center expenses, and the remaining salary that, from the literacy coach that you saw in the first line. And then the final restructured position 
uh, is the point five board certified behavior analyst, which is a special education position. Um, this is a person that works very closely with our teachers and our students in our special education programs. We actually have a 1.0 FTE right now. Um, we are finding the value of these positions more and more um, and being able to provide those services and supports for those students with uh, disabilities. We've had the 0.5 BCBA in our budget all year long. We've posted it several times. We've been unsuccessful filling it. It's actually cost us more um, to have these services than to have this position because we've had to contract out the services. So next year we are going to restructure some additional expenses from the consultative and home services line item in special education <coughs> combined with the current F.5 BCBA position to get a full-time position so that we can attract um, some qualified candidates for this, for this important role. I want to give you a snapshot of what's happened over the last several fiscal years. Uh, in how when we have to keep reducing our level service budgets each year, how eventually you have to reach a point where you're cutting the majority of what you're cutting is personnel. So over the last several fiscal years since FY14, we've cut about $3.6 million from our level service budgets each year. So each year we keep reducing our level service budget from the following year. You can see that early on we tried to make cuts away from the classroom, but as time has gone on, including the recommended budget for next year, um, it's primarily more classroom than not. And then what you will see when we do the regular day presentation is the regular day staffing cuts have been fairly even at all three levels if you include next year. Essentially, we've cut 6.6 .6 at the elementary. These are regular day classroom positions I'm talking about now. 6.6 .6 at the elementary, 7 at the middle school, and 7 at the high school. So at this point, we want to stop. That's is the overview piece. Um, take questions, and then uh, we'll start delving into the cost centers. Danny. Yes. Um, last year, we significantly cut the substitute line item to help make the budget work and protect teacher positions, and you're restoring it in this budget. Can you speak to what the impact of the substitute cut was and why you feel the need to restore that funding for next year? This year, we. Oh, sure. Um, my. What? That's a oh. TV. The people at home heard beautifully. <laughs> I'm just trying to get that off. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, my question was about the substitute line item cut that we made last year in an attempt to save teaching positions. It's being proposed to restore that money. So my question is, um, what has the impact of that cut been this year and why is there a need to restore that money in the upcoming year? So the impact in the current year, there are, sorry, I usually speak pretty loud. The, the impact in the current year is part of the funding we are utilizing some of the literacy codes. So as we've been doing various professional development lines, which historically we've funded substitutes for that, we have taken a portion of that position and that is being utilized to fund the substitutes. So I want to say not quite half, but close to half of that amount has been put towards substitute teachers. We also this year are monitoring it very closely and we do have certain holdbacks within the building-based budgets such that if we are running short within the substitute line. We are utilizing those holdbacks in order to be able to fund it, and we're looking at um, any line item in which we have ability to withhold purchases to help offset the cost of the substitutes. What we've also done in the current year, based upon historical years, is we have had a very concerted effort in order to increase the number of substitutes we have available within the district because our fill rate has historically been lower. So we ask, also have seen an increase in the amount of substitutes and an increase in the percentage fill rates we have had as well. So we're monitoring all <coughs> the sources this year in order to fund the
the shortfall from the prior year. Thank you. Yes. Can you use this? Oh, sorry. I know you mentioned that the um, we've seen a reduction in the amount coming in for the revolving fund for the athletics with our increase in fees. And I'm wondering, have we also seen a decrease in participation? I don't think that those are directly correlated if someone can't pay the fees. Or I'm wondering if we're losing people because the fees are too high or we're just not. So um, we are going to answer that question in the athletic presentation, but the quick answer is participation is actually up this year. Okay, thank you. We may maybe save this for the uh, special ed, but I just want to kind of talk through the $200,000 uh, reduction in circuit break. so I, I understand that we reduce the percentage from to 65 no, it's I want to say it's so actually that's a, sorry that that's actually a state so that is no I mean I didn't mean we reduce. Yep. I meant it was the, the state the state reduced it, was, it to 65 percent that is information they published back in October so right. we utilize the current year we circuit breaker reimbursement so that is the definitive known FY18 reimbursement that we will use next year because we are allowed to carry a year forward so that actually the number that we put in the accommodated cost is actually the number per deci okay so is there any potential movement within your uh, your organization to push that push back on that I mean can, when talking to that I, I can actually speak to that. A lot of the, the hesitancy of the state to increase circuit breaker percentage is tied in to the um, hesitancy at the federal level with federal funding with Medicare. Um, actually just got this email today about this. So the reason why they're lowering their reimbursement rate for circuit breaker is because they're concerned about the amount of funding coming in from the federal government on Medicaid. And then uh, another question, again, maybe it, we might talk about it when we do special ed, but with the uh, utilizing, uh, when we get, if we add the uh, additional 0.5 BCBA, uh, will we see a commensurate uh, reduction in uh, contract services somewhere in the budget? I yes, guess. that's why we're, re that's why we're chain we're restructuring it. It's a it's a thirty five thirty thousand dollar structure. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I it's a thirty thousand yeah. dollar. Yeah. Okay. And then just uh, I guess we'll probably talk more a lot maybe more about this on the. Uh, I mean we we added the literacy coach what two years ago or three years uh, ago. I think it's. We're now in our, next year will be the fourth year. Okay, so, and last year we we cut the math coach. Correct. And so, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what, who, who made the value judgment that now we get rid of the math coach and the literacy coach and we've decided we need a data coach instead. And I just, curious where that, I mean, was that at administration <coughs> level or? conversations with teachers or how did that come about the full team administrative team I, mean, I can answer it now if you want, if you want. sure yeah. um, that was actually that wasn't that was a decision that was made by the full administrative team and the value of that position that we're fine. we we obviously would love to have the literacy coach and the math coach and the data coach but we understand also that we need to make some difficult decisions and the amount of impact that the data coach has had on our teachers and our administrators has really uh, had, had an impact on kids. Thank you. Linda. Thank you. With the reduction in the tutor's hours, um, I understand it's one FTE, but it's across all of the tutors, so all of the tutors will lose some time. Is this going to impact those who do have 
any um, benefits, and I don't know if they do, but um, okay. I want to be fair. Um, none of our tutors, to the best of my knowledge, currently have benefits. Thank you. And, and also, yeah. just to, I, we actually cannot consider that when making personnel decisions. That does not factor into our decision <coughs> process as to whether or not they are benefited employees. G. Um, I'm yeah. aware of student privacy issues, so I don't know to the level to which you can answer this question, but there's been a reduction in special education students' tuition into the district. Can you give me some sense of what's driving that, and is it something that you project might change in the future? It's a really hard um, projection to make because that's typically other school districts who are interested in sending students to our program. So sometimes we have an increase and other special ed directors reach out to me and say, you know, I've heard you have a great program around this. Can we send a referral packet? Um, so it really isn't something, and we don't have the ability to really market. You know, we don't go out and market our programs. So it really is kind of word of mouth. And, um, you know, some last year I think we had three or four referrals that resulted in one or two placements, and this year we really haven't gotten any. Thank you. Yeah. So um, my question was similar to yours, Mrs. Borowski. But, so you said we don't really have the capacity to market those programs, but could we do more outreach and could we be more proactive about getting more students into those programs? I think we could, but we also have to remember those programs are for our students. Mm -hmm. And so then there's also a balancing of that we want to make sure the programs are really strong and that we can meet our student needs. So sometimes when we have gotten referrals, we just don't have the capacity because we don't have the space. Um, so we need to be cognizant of serving our students first. Um, it's great to have student tuition in. Other districts don't have that, but I don't feel like that should be our priority. I think our priority is servicing our students in Reading to the best of our ability in our in-district programs. And if we happen to have students tuition in, I think that's great. But given the space constraints that we've talked about, I don't think it is a priority for us to be filling some of these programs to max capacity. Okay. So, so space constraints. So there are there isn't even a whole lot of room to bring a lot of students in. Is that what I'm yeah. understanding? Yeah. 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 Yes, no. Yeah. This one easier. Is it easier? There it is. There we go. Oh, he's got two now. <laughs> Stereo. Yeah. I had a question about the the slide that it's where we slide 18 um, the regular day in special ed you can see about a five percent change in the relative um, expended funds between those two cost centers from fy15 to fy19 so shown there 27 to 32 in special ed i'm interested kind of at a high level is that relative increase of, of special ed is that being driven more by the cost of our full-time equivalents in that cost center or more by out-of-district placement? <coughs> if you have a general sense of it, I'd be in a world at night dedicated to this so we can return to that. It's, a, it's actually a combination because the out-of-district tuition, out-of-district transportation, as well as the full-time staffing are also in there. I, I don't have it on here, a, a drill down, but we have seen increases in our own in-district programs as well as an increase in the number of students out of district in the associated transportation. So it's a combination. So it's how that combination plays out. Is it heavily weighted to one end or the other in terms of out of district versus I don't have that readily available. I, I think now, what's, I what's, what's happening, the pattern here, uh, to tell the story, is that where we've had to reduce our level service budget each year, it's been at the expense of regular day. And so what has happened is, is that we are required to provide special education services, and I'm not downplaying this. We are required to provide special education services. Sometimes that looks like FTEs. Like in this budget, we've had to add some RISE preschool teacher, we've had to add paraeducators. Um, 
In other cases, it's that we have an increase of students going out of district. So we have to keep doing those costs. But when you don't have a level service budget to offset those costs, the cuts have to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, the biggest pie is regular day. Because the other cost centers, there isn't much there. So that's been really the story that's been happening over the last five years. Mm -hmm. One more. Thank you. I'm sorry. So I, I can move. No, I'm just going to get out from under that. Thank you. So I know in past years we've talked, um, and you have very successfully um, created programs that bring our students who need out of district placements back in to Reading. And again, with the caution that um, we have to respect privacy. Do you have any anticipation of that being able to happen again? I, I hear that we're losing students. They're placing out, I think, were the words that are moving out of the programs where they were here. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any um, progress in trying to bring students back to in-district programs, which would save transportation costs as long as it meets their needs. Right, so I'm gonna go more into the special ed budget on Wednesday evening. I mean, that's always our goal and our focus is on strengthening our program so we can service students in district because our obligation is to service students in the least restrictive environment. And we have the ability to offer something that no out of district placement can provide, which is access to a rich, full um, educational experience with non-disabled peers. And so that is our goal for every student and really making that opportunity <coughs> available. Um, and for some students, unfortunately, in the current moment, that might not be what they can access. And so that's also our obligation as well, is to service that student who may not be able to access um, our environment. So it is definitely a priority, and you'll see in my presentation on Wednesday, I'll be going into some of the information about, more information about our out of districts, because I know there are a lot of questions um, about where our students are, what, what is happening in that, so I'll be going over more of that on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Really quick. <clears throat> Thanks. Dr. Doherty, at the very end of this presentation, this part of the presentation, you listed out personnel cuts by level, and I just couldn't get them down quick enough, and I'm not sure I even understood the context. Could you yeah, repeat those figures? What, um, what, what I was saying is that in the regular day presentation, I'm going to show you a chart. But in a nutshell, rise slash, in the lap, if you include next year's proposed cuts, rise slash elementary 6.6, .6, middle school 7, high school 7. FTEs, this is teaching, classroom teaching positions, regular day. And that's historically going back to? The last three years. Last three years, thank yeah. you. If you include next year. Yep, 1918, 17. Yeah. Um, I just want a question on the virtual high school, so I, I understand that it will mean that we're one of the few, few districts that will no longer offer that. I'm wondering if the impact, does that impact juniors and seniors more than it impacts freshmen and sophomores um, and I, I you know while it's not desirable I, I do I recognize that I think our maintaining the AP offerings that we we can maintain and, and continue to provide is to me a little bit more important than virtual high school but I'd just like to understand how the student body is impacted uh, students choose to take virtual high school classes, mostly as electives. Mm -hmm. um, there are no required courses in virtual high school that we don't offer. So it will not impact their graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. And does it, is it, so then it impacts juniors and seniors perhaps a little bit more because they're the ones who are taking more electives? Is that sort of? There, there are other elective offerings that we teach here at the high school. Okay. Yep. This might be uh, something we can delve into more on Wednesday, but um, when I look at the percentage for regular day and the percentage for special ed, I wonder if there's actually a lot of overlap there. 
that if we're doing good teaching in our regular day, it's helping our special ed pro programs, and that if we're training our staff to be effective in, reg in, gen in um, I'm sorry, special education, that it's also going to benefit our regular day students. So although we have to put things in different budget categories, perhaps there is more overlap mm -hmm. there instead of it being a, a shift of a dollar from here to here. Yes. yes, yes, and that when we have good tier one supports, and as Dr. Doherty was talking about, as we chip away at that regular day budget, it impacts the quality of our tier one supports and what we're able to offer for all students, which then I think is where you see that kind of creeping up in special education and really looking to that um, as a service. Um, for students because it is where we have to provide the service. We don't have an option. But we want to be a district where any student can come who has a need and we can support them. They don't need to be a student with a disability or accessing special education. We want to be able to support all learners as they come into our district through our interventions and the things we can provide to our regular day budget. So that's part of that vision for our district as a whole. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I just want to add though that this the overlap mm. it does not it does not mean that um, if there are special education services to be delivered to a student as part of a plan yes. that that person is not that student is not getting those services because they're being shared I think what's really important here is to understand the tier one and the training that we try to do for yes. teachers which we call professional development that's the training we do for teachers to en enhance and improve their skills um, that would impact yep. their ability to be an excellent teacher across an entire spectrum, right? That, that we need to do with the regular day mm -hmm. cadre of teachers. Yep. And so when we keep cutting this because we have to move more resources and money into special education because mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's the law or more the law. So I, I just don't want the public to think that we are taking services from me. Okay, this, I wanted to give the community an opportunity that if you have any questions, there'll be, yeah, so I don't know if it's the only easy way that you're going to have to come up. Does that one work over there? No, I think we might have to put that one up there. Sorry. Paul. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> and I should you know understand these comedy first on the comedy cost by now, but um, being on FinCom, but when we have an impact to be effective, two hundred thousand dollars significant to the state circuit breaker reimbursement program, does that fall under a comedy? Mm -hmm. it's it part I mean, it's still an impact nonetheless, but I was just trying to understand yeah. the way that that it. it is. Yeah, so it's not just the expense, it's also the Yes. Um, when we offset. build the budget, we take the expense as well as the reimbursement <coughs> we're receiving from the state to budget a net number. So it is in, oh. it is reflected in there. Did everyone hear that? Anyone under need to hear the answer? <laughs> yes. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yes, tomorrow. Um, Carolyn, sorry, back to you. Um, I'm wondering, and maybe in your presentation it's going to come up, will you be able to talk a little bit about benchmarking versus other districts in terms of the split between what we see budgeted for regular ed versus special ed? Um, are we similar? Are we different? And why? And what are other districts doing in the face of the same kinds of issues. Thanks. Thank you. Are you anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Yes. So next we're going to move into the Administration Call Center. The first slide here we put in here just as a summary reminder. We did 
as part of the budget presentation in December go through all of the detail what each cost center comprises so we're not going to go into that level of detail this is more in case people did not participate in that they would have it in one complete slide deck but the administration cost center is 2.4 percent of the total budget the next slide we go into the details so the FY19 recommended budget is just over a million dollars and a one million forty three thousand dollars that is up 12.6 percent from the current adopted budget of nine hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars this cost center reflects all of the cost of living adjustment for non-represented members of the central office team um, the budget does not include any salary adjustment for the superintendent that salary has been held constant to the FY 18 level as we mentioned earlier this cost center does reflect the restoration of the school business <coughs> assistant position so the most significant portion of the increase is the restoration of that budget there is no impact total budget wise but there are shifts between various cost centers in order to fund this position also within this cost center we have seen increases within the employer contribution for tax sheltered annuity that is within the collective bargaining agreement in which we do make a $175 contribution for certain members of um, the collective bargaining agreement we have seen an increase in the current year based upon an increase in participation as we talked about at the last school committee meeting it is a positive that um, the RTA has done outreach to the teachers and we have seen an increase in them contributing to their retirement account which has led to an increase in the contribution we have also seen an increase in mandate mandated new employee physicals as we mentioned we are doing a very proactive approach in order to increase the number of substitute teachers in order to ensure that we do have um, good fill rates for the substitutes as part of that there is the cost of the mandated employee physicals as we talked about we are restructuring the school business assistant the main responsibilities for this individual will be to do a deeper dive into a lot of the Medicaid reimbursements we do receive a decent amount of money each year that goes back to the town budget that is part of the revenue we are going to look for ways to revisit what we're claiming to see if there are ways we can increase that also as part of the grants management to make sure we're taking advantage of all of the various grants this position works closely with the various cost centers to make sure we're applying timely for the grants and that we're getting the money on a timely basis from a reimbursement standpoint and as we've talked about this will help with the procurement of curriculum professional development and also we will be able to deploy the resources to assist more with revolving accounts and student activity accounts this is a high level summary of the various components of the administration call center so these are the same categories that we looked at high level for the entire budget the professional salaries that is based upon contractual increases for members of um, the administration cost center the clerical salaries that increase is driven by increases cost of living for the clerical staff as well as the addition of the um, 1.0 school business assistant the other line item that has the more significant increase is the other expenses that is where the tax sheltered annuity and mandated new employee physicals are within that line item so those are the major changes within this cost center just a quick staffing chart the only staffing change that we are proposing is the restructuring of the school business assistance so the FTEs are going up by one FTE within the administration cost center year over year within the bucket budget packages that everyone has received there is additional detail on page 28 which shows each individual lineup line item that makes up the various buckets and as we talked about the clerical salaries the main increase is due to the addition of the 1.0 school business assistant 
within the other expenses you see the employee benefits and the hiring and recruiting those are the two items that we talked about being the tax sheltered annuity contribution as well as the mandated employee physicals and the increase that we are showing for the employee benefits the current year budget as we talked about at the last school committee meeting our actuals have exceeded that based upon the increased participation so we know current year is higher than current year budget so we have built next year's budget with an assumed increase in staffing as well as an increase in participation With that, we will open it up if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. Hi. So on the um, business uh, person, the new person, grants management is one of the responsibilities. So our district's gotten quite a lot of grant money over the years. Is there any chance that person is also going to be helpful in applying for grants? We're hopeful that we, if this position is restored that they will be able to work very closely with the various business units as well as being more on the forefront if there are new grant funding opportunities out there that they can help monitor they won't write them they won't write grants, no they will though? not write no. this is not a grant writer this is more the management side to say the grants are available they're out there there are new grants whether it be the title four whether it be additional usually special we're, ed. we're writing the grants <laughs> we're the grant writers so maybe it will be helpful to <laughs> you all though at yes least. It, it's okay. also the actual administration piece that yes. once you write it once there is a whole a separate mm -hmm. process to yes. actually apply for administer yes. all of the required reporting and audits that yeah. go along with it the good news is you get the money the bad news is you get the money exactly. <laughs> it's a lot of work to get a I just wanted to say and I just wanted to say thank you again for all the work you put into this budget um, one of the things that I keep hearing is the cost of mandated new employee physicals who does the state mandate these physicals or do we mandate these physicals it's the town sorry town town is that have we looked across towns I know I substitute taught in another town and never had a physical I'm just wondering if we have a lot of subs if that's something um, whether that's a necessary cost yeah. I have not looked into what other towns are requiring that's something we can pose the question to other towns but I know that we do require it for substitute teachers so that is one of the bigger drivers is we tend to have a good amount of turnover within the substitute teacher population and a substitute teacher might teach once they might teach mm -hmm. 20 times but correct so just Let's try along those lines uh, Gail that's in I missed what you said that was that's in the hiring and recruiting line yes it is okay I mean I think that's basic it's what five thousand dollars it looks like I mean that's good risk management I think that you know we gotta be you know I think that's a good thing to make sure they're healthy when they come in I mean that helps out just a lot of things one of the things that's important is if you don't do things like that that's what opens you up to liability so one of the parts of the physical that all the employees have to have is um, uh, substance abuse testing mm -hmm. And all of those, all of the people we hire pretty much work with children, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Just to elaborate on the additional 1FTE for the business restored school business assistant. Um, the responsibilities for this are, are there additional capacity that this position will provide uh, would you characterize it as an operational expense going forward if if this was adopted so are there new things this individual would do that aren't being done now and what is the impact of having this individual for the future and ongoing um, you know year over year so there are areas that will allow us to have more oversight there are a couple of areas where we're constantly ensuring that we have appropriate segregation of duties within the department so from a segregation of duties redundancy um, 
you have one person that runs all functions, that person isn't here or that person leaves, there is nobody to step into that role. In addition, with student activities, revolving accounts, having an additional set of eyes that can actually be in there scrubbing, looking at data on an ongoing basis rather than quarterly, periodically throughout the year. So this would really allow us to enhance <coughs> that as well as, as Carolyn and I have discussed, we do feel there are opportunities within the Medicaid reimbursement that we just do not have the capacity to actually tap into exploring what we're yeah. submitting for reimbursement. So there are also opportunities where we could be receiving additional reimbursement that we just right now do not have the capacity without putting other things we could not do grants and do Medicaid. We can do grants and not do Medicaid. So right now it's becoming, we wouldn't have to make some of those either or decisions. Yes. I just think one of the things that, that we on the committee all know is um, the extent to which Mrs. Dowd is working an excessive number of hours to get the job done in the community. Some people in the community know that, other people don't. It is beyond what could be expected of someone and, and we need this resource and I think um, I would agree that you know it was it was a mistake to try to cut it but again we've been in this position of trying to to cut and li limit the impacts on students and so that was one of the cuts that we made in an attempt to not make a cut that was more directly towards students two years ago and we learned we, we cannot do that and I think we have an outstanding person in that role right now We'd like to keep her in that role, and I think this is an important part of ensuring that we do that, as well as the additional um, types of items and, and capacities that we'd be able to get to. So in case the public isn't aware of that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Did anyone from the community have a question? Yes, Amy. Oh, you're going to use that. Thanks. Sorry um, to go back one section, but um, to your regular day reductions, uh, figure six, I think, in your handout, um, you talk about the number of FTEs in the elementary classroom teachers, middle school classroom teachers, et cetera, um, and the reductions. And so is it correct in assuming to avoid just those cuts? would be a, a, a you, you would need an approximate uh, another $800,000, something like that, for those. And then, <clears throat> but that doesn't cover the high school teachers, if you go to figure 19, um, that if you, f over the past four years or so, um, that have lost about eight, eight FTE. Seven, eight, eight. seven FTE, high school. The, the last school. three years. If you blue, if you the last three years. Okay. If you go back to s uh, 15, 16, it goes from 78 down to 70. So, that, so, so, do you have a rough estimate of how much it would be to replace those teachers on top of not cutting the? I I think those are questions that we can better answer on Thursday night. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Well, copies of the presentation on the screen. Yes, we are going to post those we'll post after, after tonight's Thank meeting. You. Yes, G. I just wanted to ask a the way I read something in here, I just want to make sure I understood it. It appears that this budget proposal proposes no cost of living adjustment for the superintendent salary? Correct. And if my memory serves, we approved a budget last year that also did not have a cost of living adjustment for the superintendent salary? Correct. So if this goes through, he would have gone two years without the cost of living adjustment. Thank you. Yes. The uh, salary tables for professional and clerical salaries, slide 29, are those, all of those salaries subject to contractual increases other than superintendents or the dispensers? It is. How much of that money is not contractual? Oops, sorry, no. 
Oh, within the book. Within the book? No, it's no, the it's slide. Slide. Oh, slide. Yeah. There you go. It's the first two rows. It, that is a combination of um, members of the administration con <coughs> cost center that have a contract that part of it is contractual, part of it is cost of living adjustments for those that are not on a contract. So is it so is it more than say ten percent of that number that is not subject to a contract? Yes. That would be cost of living that have been built into the budget. So as we as we move forward, maybe a follow up question can be right. Thanks. Any other questions? John, did you want to move on? To sure. So now we move to district-wide programs. Uh, I'm going to do this part of the presentation. So again, it's, um, this is a slide that you saw in December. But uh, district-wide programs is four mini cost centers, and one is probably the easiest way to explain it. So you have athletics, you have at, which is primarily at the high school, extracurricular, which is, again, primarily at the high school. There is some at the middle school. Um, your health services, which is your director and your school nurses, and all of the related costs that, that go with that. And then your network and technology infrastructure. This is different from instructional technology. So this is all of the supports that go along with maintaining um, our network and making sure that we have a safe network um, for, our, for our students and staff. So in this here are the major changes. This is a 5.8% increase from FY18. Again, we have contractual increases for represented and non-represented personnel. Um, so in this uh, cost center, you have nurses, technicians, coaches. Um, you have the extracurricular stipends for drama and band. Um, the athletic director and the network manager are all in this cost center. Um, we have seen, as Gail mentioned earlier, some contractual increases for next year for pool rental at the Y, ice rink time at Burbank, um, and the athletic transportation. We are in the third year of that five-year contract. Um, as Gail mentioned earlier, we have a decrease in the athletic revolving account um, offset, which is impacting this cost center. Uh, we are seeing an increase, again, as Gail mentioned earlier, because um, we are renewing our antivirus protection and other technology software. So this is, we're seeing a blip because it, for, we don't pay for a couple of years and then we have to renew it and um, it's, a, it's a third year, so we're up for renewal for next year. And then the, the reduction that you see in this cost center is what I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, where we are going to reduce the number of non-league games played per level and per student. So breaking this down um, in the impact, as I mentioned earlier, is this will affect all three levels, varsity, JV, freshman. Uh, we are looking at non-league games. We're looking at one home game, one away game, which impacts your transportation costs and game official expenses. So for away games, it would be transportation for um, home games that we game official. We will make a commitment to the Middlesex League, play the full schedule. Um, essentially what we're talking about is a reduction of two games. Um, there are some sports that there'll be an exception based on uh, the um, mandatory number of games that we do have to provide per league rules or MIAA. Here is the uh, budget by program. Um, and all of the drivers uh, lead to the increases or decreases that you see here. Uh, so the athletics is um, increased again, this is by the contractual increases. Um, extracurricular, uh, one of the eight major increases here is that we are seeing an increase in the drama stipends for next year. Um, this is due to the, um, the, the shows and we're, we're budgeting assuming that we're going to have two musicals, um, which does increase the number of, of stipends. Um, your health services has remained pretty flat. This is a salary driven uh, piece of this cost center. Uh, the technology piece we already talked about, and that's really because of the services and expenses 
uh, as well as some uh, contractual increase. If you look at it by uh, program, you can see that, again, um, the we're pretty much staying uh, level funded or, or um, flatlined in a lot of areas. The ES supplies and materials increase uh, for health services is, um, even though it looks like a large percentage is, is only about eighteen hundred dollars. Um, you can see that we're also think there are also some negatives in here. Uh, in terms of athletics, uh, what what you're seeing here in the reductions is primarily driven by the reductions um, that I that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, with the reduction of games, the two games per sport, which impacts your um, contracted services, which is transportation um, and <coughs> other expenses. <coughs> and with extracurricular, here's what I was talking about earlier with the stipends. Here's the increase in the stipends, the salary piece, and that's because of the, the shows. Um, and then with the technology piece, the contracted services is uh, the area that we were talking about earlier with the um, increase in, we did cut the consultant last year. We're, we've increased that back up. Well, the Leonard is now online. Um, I don't know where she is. Is she out there somewhere? Julian, you gotta show me some way how to shut this off. I, um, and the other expenses, I believe this is the, uh, the antivirus. Uh, in terms of staffing, the staffing for the district-wide programs is staying flat. Wow. There are no um, there are no cuts being proposed. If you remember last year, we did reduce a technician uh, from this cost center. It has had a major negative impact on um, on the um, efficiency and getting uh, ticket items addressed in a timely manner this year. That so that is. That has had a negative impact um, this year. I I know you asked uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Doxer about the um, the participation. So here's here's a list of participation in high school athletics by sport. Uh, obviously, the 2017-18 does not include the spring numbers because that season has not happened yet. But overall participation is up 28 students from this time last year. So the numbers are staying strong and they're actually increasing. Um, but as Mrs. Dowd said, we are what we are seeing though is we have we have about 10% of our students now in the district on free and reduced lunch, wow. which is the highest number in a long time. Yeah. Um, and so that has an impact on any fee that we charge in the district. Um, if a student is on free lunch, they would not pay the fee. If they're on reduced, they get a reduced rate. So that impacts full day kindergarten. That impacts athletics, it impacts um, bus transportation, rise, tuition, any of those areas where um, a tuition or a fee is required. And then in the actual budget book, we've broken it down for you. You can see um, broken down by page 47 is the health services. And pretty much what I've already outlined is what I've talked about, so on page 47, um, you can see it breaks it down even further by detail in terms of the increases and the decreases. Page 48 for athletics. You can see under revolving fund support, the $50,000 decrease, um, which does impact the entire percentage of the budget. So the reason why it's a 7.4% increase primarily is because of that uh, $50,000 reduction in your revolving account. And then you can see cuts in other areas. Essentially we have either cut or remained flat in many areas of the athletic budget. And then on page 50, I'm sorry, um, 50. 50, yep, 50. Um, you see the extracurricular budget, and the biggest increase here is the stipends, which is what I mentioned earlier. Everything else pretty much has been level funded. And then on 51, district technology and maintenance, um, 
see some of the personnel items, you see a contractual increase. Um, we do see some increases for the consulting services, which we mentioned earlier, to bring it back up to FY, close to FY17 levels. It's a cut we made last year that we couldn't sustain. Um, you also see an increase in um, the other expenses, which is your antivirus piece and the software line item. And then the only other piece I want to point out on page 52 and gives us an inventory. What, what we're now trying to capture is the inventory by age of our computers. You can see that we're trying to get closer to a five-year replacement cycle. This is, this is student and uh, teacher computers. Uh, so we're trying to get closer to a five-year replacement cycle. Uh, right now, we're probably on a seven or eight-year replacement cycle, which is one of the biggest drivers why we need to had to restore that $50,000 uh, technology line item back up to $100,000 this year. So I think now we're at questions for this cost. John, on the uh, athletics for work, uh, cutting back the schedules, does that you mentioned game game officials for home games and transportation for, but is that shortening seasons where a stipend would be prorated to or no? Uh, and how uh, how does that? I mean, we'll still be able to compete for uh, league titles or seedings and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. And Mr. Zaya is here, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Zaya, the, the MIA, it's usually a percentage of wins, not necessarily you have to have a minimum number of wins. So it's a percentage. And I believe it's 50% to qualify for a tournament? 50%. For most sports. For most, yeah. There are some exceptions. I mean, football, we're not going to be reducing the football schedule because they have to play the 10 games. Um, you know, so, but there will not be, to answer your first question, there will not be a reduction in the stipend. We don't, we don't increase the stipend if they make the state tournament. Right. Would be the, so. <laughs> no, I wasn't necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> just asking. Throw that out there. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> on the uh, figure 34, is stipends, is that what you mentioned? Is that the uh, two shows? Yes. Yes. That is a placeholder for now. We are still working through, and we, we've looked historically if we have more than one musical, what the, the cost would be. Okay, and then on figure 32, others, what's the other salaries total that went up 92%? Is that just moving something? That is the impact of reducing the offset. I get it. Thank you. Any other? Yes. I know that what I'm about to ask is probably a very small number, but I'm wondering about the transportation. Is that something that's increased? Are we able to investigate whether towns can share buses to tournaments, depending on the size of the teams? You mean so if? Burlington and Reading are going to the same tournament game? Or Wakefield and Reading are going to the same tournament. Yeah, could they share a bus? Um, again, Depending I, on the I size would defer to Mr. Zaya, but part of the problem is he wouldn't have enough seats. That's why I was saying. Does yeah, so space, on the space would be an team. issue on the bus. Um, you know, I, I know that, that Tom has looked at different ways that we can maximize our transportation costs, you know, like the golf team use certain type of transportation versus the football team and we do the best we can with that but it, you know it doesn't really resolve a lot of savings yes thanks more small potatoes 
Uh, if we had a second show, would the revolving fund support go up because of increased ticket sales? Would it, it would, make sense pay for itself? It would depend upon the ticket sales within the revolving and also the overall cost of the show. So if you do a second musical, the cost of the props and everything yep. else also goes mm -hmm. up, and that is 100% self-funded within the revolving account. We don't have any of the sets in that within the operating budget as well as the programs and other information such as that so just, just to clarify we're not adding a show oh and a, a musical, musical. We're, we're, of, we're budgeting yeah. four shows we've always budgeted yeah. four shows yeah. it's the type of show that that you it's okay so that's why the the yes. revolving didn't go up. correct okay thank you all right oh, so Nick So again, looking at the district-wide network uh, technology table, the increase in software, can you just tell us the basis for that increase from 6,000 to 32,000? That is a combination. We have um, certain items that were within the capital plan last year that were covered as year one. You were able to include it within the capital and then the ongoing maintenance is in the current year we also have the placeholder for the antivirus software is within that as well that that it has been three years since we have renewed that one we did a three-year agreement last time we did it so that cost has not been in the budget for the past two years mm -hmm. so it's a combination of those two items are the main drivers we also know that some of the state contracts are coming up, so our Office 365, we've started to see some of the increases in the state contract because that was a three-year contract that is also up for renewals, so we're, uh, we're hitting some major milestones on the state OSD contract list. And we get a better price for that than we would if we bundled somehow with the town because we're educational or no? So we actually can't. Okay. We actually get a cheaper rate, but if we bundled it with the town, we would get the town rate. We have to do the educational rate. So it's a better rate than we would yeah. always get. Right, thank you. Thank you. Mary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know the rate too. <laughs> yeah. um, Barry Berman, member of the select board. Um, I know we've done a number of different synergies between the town and um, the schools and things like we share an HR person, um, we've um, consolidated facilities. Um, can you talk about anything that we have done, um, uh, synergies with the town and the schools on technology per se? What, I mean, obviously a license, obviously Nick's question just addressed that, but anything about hardware, sharing a, a a person that can actually do both? I mean, obviously it's, we have to, you have different systems and networks, but if you know if there's a cost that could be shared, again, it's it's small, but the pennies add up. So we actually looked into this a couple of years ago um, when we brought a new network manager on board. The conclusion that came at that point is that there would be no way that we could consolidate staff. That both the town and the school staff are already taxed. Um, I just mentioned we just cut a technician in this year by the way. Um, and our return rate on tickets is we've noticed a depreciable uh, decrease in time, uh, increase in the amount of time it takes to get our uh, tickets um, addressed. Uh, in terms of combining services, um, educational pricing is different than municipal pricing and um, we can't mix it. Uh, we do get a less expensive rate on a lot of different technology and software. Um, and we aren't allowed to bundle it with municipal. Bundle us, of course. No. <laughs> um, so we did look into this a couple years ago. Uh, and there is a lot of collaboration that occurs between our network manager and the town's network manager um, in terms of, you know, making sure, because we have the same, um, same loop uh, that we that we both use, and and there's a lot of times where we have to rely on each other to uh, to get certain software up and running, like Munis and things like that. Um, but we would not be able to save money by 
sharing positions. Yes. Uh, just a question. When you're talking about like IT tickets, we're talking about sort of Julian getting to things that are impacting a teacher's ability to work with students. Right. Or maybe, I mean, I would imagine most of the time it's it's technology that the that either students are using directly, or teachers are using to um, to to affect. Yeah. The, the majority of our tickets is their classroom tickets. Right. Yes. It's not like. I mean, it might be their email occasionally, some problem, but it's right. It's it's things. mostly it's mostly okay. uh, instructional technology. Okay. Yes. Again, not a big ticket item. Do we still have a rocket desk that's supporting the teachers? We do not. We don't have the staff. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. Thank you. John, you may have mentioned it. I was, I missed it on figure 35. What was the consulting services? The consulting services, we cut that last year. That is instances in which we do not have the necessary resources internally for all of the various applications and technology that we have that we have to call and outsource it to consulting. We cut that budget this year, but we're restoring it back to historic levels. So if we're doing upgrades or as we're going through various projects, if we have questions or issues as we're deploying and implementing it. Same figure, uh, 35 in the handout. So I noticed uh, handful of expenses that seem, seem to all move together and I'm just curious why and if there's anything to learn from this. So if I go back, i kind of got to look at the figure in front of you here. Um, I noticed that FY17 expended to adopt to FY18 under technician. We have to cut that, I think Dr. Durney just mentioned, from 296 down to 253. So I get that. But then what strikes me is that if I go down to information management, we go from zero to 6K. Supplies and materials, you go from 196 to 6K, and then you maintain that. And then go down to networking and telecom, we go from zero to 11,700. Software, we go from six to 32,000 this year. Software and licensing support, we go from zero to 1,500. And then other expenses, we just talked about that, Gail, earlier, 19, four to 45. So I'm just wondering if there's something structurally going on here. When I add all the new expenses and I compare it to the cut that was made two years ago, I notice the new expenses are greater and that we're maintaining those new expenses year over year. I'm just curious if there's something structurally, if there are any questions we should be asking about kind of big picture in a way that would require some specialized knowledge of IT to ask. When I, but when I see all these new expenses coming online, we make a small cut and a whole bunch of new expenses pop yeah. up and then they stay with us. And I'm wondering what's going on. So there are, I was actually trying to find the detail for um, that. There are instances, again, in which items have been covered in the capital budget last year, which you would not have seen in the current year. So we have ongoing maintenance. Um, UPS the UPS batteries is one example. And I will, I will look over to Julian, who, who can pipe in. So that is a cost that was previously absorbed as part of the capital on the town side that is now the IT side of the town and the IT side of the school are now absorbing those costs now that is no longer part of the capital plan. We also have increases within the um, antivirus software that we mentioned has not been in there for the past three years, so this will be the first year that we see it. We're also continuously looking at how we're classifying items as there might be changes on the DESI side as to how we have to classify various categories, so you might see shifts and part of it is also the various types of services where it may have been one bundled one way one year and bundled another, so we may be splitting it out differently within the various DESI categories that we have. But a lot of it is driven on state contracts with the Office 365. We have already started to reach out to get quotes for next year, and we're seeing an increase in that, so we've built that in because we're coming off of a three-year state contract, even though we renew it every year there's a set price for 
the length of the state contract that was up for renewal so we are seeing an increase as well as if we have an increase in users that drives it um, the antivirus is another one that is new for the coming year and then as we did some of the district-wide technology improvements over the past couple of years within the capital plan the ongoing licensing and maintenance after you do your initial purchase which could last you one to two years becomes a regular operating expense so it's it can be a shift between capital and operating depending on the year I think the other thing too um, you know and this is before Julian and and Gail were here three, four years ago. Our network three or four years ago, I had grave concerns about in terms of security and um, you know the ability for data breaches, things like that. Uh, our network is much stronger now three years later because of some of the things that we put in place. That costs more money to upkeep and maintain as well. So I think you're seeing that our network is stronger. We've we've done the wool have completed by this summer, thanks to the facilities department and our technology department, um, you know, our, the a wireless access points upgraded all those. Um, all of these things combined with things that you're seeing in this budget are improving the network security for our students and teachers. Any other questions? Anything else from the community? Yes, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Sanfi, um, 75 Glenmere Circle, and um, I want to thank you. I know this is a painful discussion to start and a very difficult budget to put together. Um, my question is more for the person at home that's listening. When you talk about the loss of the technician last year, so we went from 5.5 FTE to 4.5, and I understand that in this budget we're not able to restore that. But the ticket system, I don't think everybody understands what that is. And if you could give a few scenarios of how that impacts a teacher when she or he shows up at work in the morning and their technology isn't working, and then how that directly affects the children. So um, my guess is you're going to hear some of this in other meetings coming up from teachers who will probably attend and talk about that. Uh, what a ticket is, is when when we when we had the technician, we did have a ticket to prior to the loss of the technician, but to try to make things more efficient, we went really with a full-blown ticket system where um, if someone has an issue with technology, they would submit a ticket online um, and then it would get assigned um, to a technician uh, or a tech integration specialist, depending on what the what the nature of the ticket is, for um, to get addressed. So um, the amount of time it's taking now to get those tickets addressed is has been significantly impacted in a negative way by the loss of this position. So whereas we probably had 50 tickets maybe out there. When we were fully staffed, we now have 100 to 200 tickets. And so when you're a teacher that needs a smart board working um, in the classroom, and you need it that day, you don't need it three days from now, um, that's, that's impactful. It, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have a cart of laptops that do not have the proper software on there, um, and that needs to get um, imaged. Or image means you, you get the proper software on to each of the laptops. Um, if, if that isn't done in a timely manner, then those computers can't be used for the purpose of the classroom. So, and Julian is now going to. I'm arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, when I first started, we had a very basic ticketing system that we. Um, track major issues with, and it wasn't very good. Um, so we actually, like John was saying, we actually have a full-blown system <coughs> where we're tracking metrics of tickets. So how many we're getting from a certain school, 
how many we're getting from a certain teacher, how many we're getting from a certain type of computer, that sort of thing. And overall, what we're seeing is our backlog. We were running around month to month, we had about 50 open tickets. With the majority of those 50 open tickets, what we were seeing is they were mostly project-based. So things like, we need a new cart of laptops for this hallway, or we need to have projectors replaced in this wing, or something like that. Now what we're seeing is, can't change my password, and we're getting multiple issues where we just can't get to them fast enough. So we've got this in, um, so this past summer, we implemented a couple of technology replacement um, initiatives for the wireless, for the network storage, and uh, also replacing some of the network hardware like servers and things like that, including the network architecture itself. And so to get those things done, there's me, and then there's one other person that helps me. So when I take him off of closing tickets, it even reduces it further. So now, um, so what we've done is we've actually accommodated some of the cost of the consulting services so that I can keep that person working on closing tickets mm -hmm. and also get things done faster on things that I may not fully know how to implement on, on my own by bringing in a consulting <coughs> service. Okay. Thank you. I, I mean, it makes it pretty understandable that if the smart board doesn't work, then you can't teach your lessons that you were going to use the technology or if you're running a project. And, yeah, and it's tough, too, because we, you know, we, we're a service-based organization, so we're driven by what we provide to the teachers. That's what makes our day, right? We, we want to help people. And so it's, uh, you know, only being here now, um, like two and a half years now, the first year and a half was, it was aces, because it was like every day you could brighten somebody's day and do something great for them. We had an awesome relationship with our teachers. And it's getting to the point now where it's like, ooh, I don't want to see you know, <laughs> like, Not for lack of very hard work. It's just the cuts have been difficult because of our limited resources. You know, I told John when I first started that I wanted to try and automate as much as possible. And so, that's what we've been trying to do. But even with that automation that we've put in place, it's, we're not keeping up with it. It's really difficult when we've lost one person. No, than I thought. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're good. We're actually going to have um, Joe, Huggins. Joe Huggins, the Director of Facilities, um, co-present. <coughs> and w the approach we're going to take is we're going to have the school facilities, which is the school custodian piece, a very high-level overview of the core facilities as it as it relates to the school side because as you know there is the core piece which was presented to the selectmen but there is a portion of that that does relate to the schools and then once we go through those we will discuss the FY19 capital as part of this thank you everybody so um, we just put up the slide to let everybody see what the uh, facilities department's mission is. As you know, we take care of uh, 17 buildings within the town of Reading. Uh, we service all the municipal buildings as well as all the school facilities uh, on both sides. And we have just about 1.1 million square feet of space that we maintain for the town of Reading. Um, and this just gives you kind of an overview of what our mission's mission is. our organization chart, um, director of facilities, we have an uh, administrative assistant, an assistant director uh, who handles the maintenance technician outside contractors and the town cleaning contracts, and then a school facilities manager who is in charge of the 23 uh, custodians within the um, eight school buildings, and the school cleaning contract, which is here at the high school at the Coolidge 
and we have a rental coordinator uh, who's in charge of event technicians for rental of the space in the schools. <coughs> this slide just gives everybody a general overview of where the square footage lies. 85% um, of the square footage is on the school side, 15% is on the town buildings. So this, this next slide is kind of an important one because we're going to get into a little bit of how we kind of work things down in the facilities department. Um, we have a, um, a uh, work order system platform made by a company called Dude Solutions. And this company provides us with a work order system, preventive maintenance system. Uh, we do also do utility tracking through it. And we have um, also do some, uh, another module that we just implemented last year which enables us to tie our energy management system into our rental program so that when we rent a space, it actually optimizes start and stop times for all the, for all the spaces that are rented within that particular building. And these, all these different modules that we're talking about all speak to one another and uh, work together. And we do utilize work order systems similar to Julian to tracking everything. This is one of the actual modules that we use, the utility track. Uh, that we implemented uh, last year um, and if you basically what the story is telling you is that we're this year this past year we're trending pretty much on average with what we've done over the last five years um, as far as our, our utilities uh, the three commodities natural gas water and electricity so we're performing pretty well so this slide right here um, and this is just for schools only uh, gives you an idea um, what we are paying um, to run per square foot each facility for the utilities. So if you look at cost per square foot to run like the Birch Metal School is dollar twenty-two. And if you go down the line, you can see more or less really where we're spending our money. Some of the buildings, like you're looking down there at Coolidge and the Wood End, um, those buildings. Um, have irrigation, which is one of the one of the uh, ir outdoor irrigation for fields. So that's why that's a little bit higher on that. Uh, there are it's field irrigation at those two locations, and that's one of the commodities also. That's why it's a different cost per square foot. So this, this slide's a little tough to see, but basically what this is telling you is that in FY16 we did 2,381 work orders, in FY17 we did just under 2,600 work orders, uh, which is roughly 218 more work orders we, um, that we were able to um, complete. So last year, we added a new position. We added a, a maintenance technician position, which is a uh, master carpenter. And the goal of that, adding that position, was to free up our master electrician and master plumber to do more of what they are being paid to do, which is those two trades and what we've been able to do is complete more in-house work orders went from 68 to 73 percent and, and reduce the amount of um, billable hours by outside contractors we're using these guys to diagnose issues and in some cases do repairs that we would normally try to we'd have to call a contractor in so at least we have our guys look at it first and sometimes they can complete the repair it's free them up so to dive a little bit deeper into the actual school facilities cost center, so this is the portion that is directly within the school department's budget, which is the school custodians as well as the cleaning contract um, that we mentioned. So we are seeing an increase of 7.4% in the budget, so just over 91000 In total, quick breakdown of that is in the third year of the cleaning contract, we did have roughly a $100,000, $98,500 increase in the contract. What we did is, after we looked at the total budget, we, we worked closely with the facilities department. We are cutting $18,000 from that. And what that will be is the removal of two of the vacation cleanings here at the high school that um, Joe and his team will determine how to best allocate that funding also within here are the cost of living adjustments for um, the members of the collective bargaining as well as non-represented members 
This shows you the high level breakdown. So again, within the professional salaries and clerical salaries, that is the contractual increases for the represented and non-represented. The contract services, that reflects the increase in the cleaning contract that we discussed. Supplies and materials and other expenses, we have shifted funds between the two line items to keep them flat and mainly that represents an increase within equipment as we're looking to replace some of our aging radios within there. So we cut some other expenses in order to fund that line item. Within the school facilities call center, we are keeping the staffing levels consistent year over year. There is no proposed increases or decreases. The decreases will come from reducing the cleaning, at, in the vacation cleanings through the contract. Similar to the other call centers, um, on page 53 of the budget book, we have the detail of the call center. Um, as folks are aware, last year, we at the after the budget was adopted for the current year, we did do the buyout of the longevity as part of the collective bargaining agreement. So that has been removed from the FY19 budget and the rest of the increases are as we discussed, which is mainly the increase in the cleaning contract. So we did want to spend just a couple of moments on the town core, which is these slides will be similar to those who attended the Board of Selectmen meetings uh, back in December, but as they relate to the schools, we also wanted to present them to the school committee. So what you're looking up here is we've got town facilities, which is um, the, that contract, I'll, I'll just give you a quick overview. That's, that's the town custodians and the cleaning contracts for the town buildings. Core facilities is town and school building maintenance. And what's under that is all utility expenses, the facilities maintenance men, which is four people, myself, the assistant director, and the secretary. And it's all the, it's all the money to do the maintenance and upkeep of all 17 locations. The, um, if you look at the percentage change, it's 0.1% in the core. 4.8% on the town, which you don't really, it's not pertinent to this. Um, and there is some salary um, at 3 point, is it a, it's a 1.9% increase for the town facilities and 3.8 for the core, which is collective bargaining contractual. And this just gives you an overview of the total increase, which is 0.1%. We thought this slide would be kind of good for you folks to see exactly what we're spending on our, um, what our request is for the FY19 for our electricity for the school buildings, natural gas, water and sewer, which is up 3.89% over last year. So I think you have a question on the, uh, Figure 37 on the, you know, you talked about in the presentation, the, the cleaning, sir. So can you, are we, you, are you said we were in the third year of a, is, it, is there any way of getting them in here early? And because that's a big increase. Uh, and as in renegotiating to maybe keep, you know, change, uh, keep them on for, be creative with that or do you have to go out to bid to do in the the short answer is because it is done per the procurement laws if we wanted to restructure the agreement we would have to go back out to bid mm -hmm. to do it in these I believe this was before my time but they were the low cost they were bidder when we did it so the only areas we can change without having to go back out to bid is the menu options which are the vacation cleanings if we change the structure of the contract itself, we would have to do a whole full right. bid proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Mr. Um, 
I have a question about the uh, along the line of Mr. Robinson's about the significant increase in the contract. Have you done any analysis of what it would mean to bring that in-house? Is there any possibility that bringing those th those services in-house and not contracting them out at this price point might be beneficial? Did you look at that at all? Well, it's all done with part-time people at night, the cleaning. Sorry. All the cleaning is done with part-time people at night in the high school, and we have a person at Coolidge also. So there's no benefit being paid. And that's the big thing, is that, you know, we'd have to carry the full package. You'd, you, we, we wouldn't be able to get part-time people, number one. You'd want to go full-time. Um, and then there'd be a cost associated with the benefit. And, you'd, you know, you'd, it's much, it's more economical to do it with an outside contractor. In a lot of cases, it works really good in the high school because they have a supervisor here at night. It doesn't really lend itself to working well in an elementary setting. Um, because usually those buildings have one person and you really can't get the kind of supervision with one person. Mm -hmm. So it works good as far as a team or a crew approach goes. And to answer your question, as far as like the pricing goes, they came in with a very competitive price, but they had a big, a big investment in the building, is in equipment and um, materials when they came into the contract. So it's a multi-year contract and so there are increases every year. So they're making up, yeah, this, it's, it's a contractual increase and um, I will tell you that the price we are paying is a very, very good price for the size building. <coughs> and I can, I, can, uh, I can only tell you that because I deal with a lot of other facilities directors in other towns. We're paying a very good price here to get the high school cleaned. Thank you. Even with the increase? Yes. Nick. When we look at the cost of services in contracts, do we look at the all-in cost for the current duration of the contract? Is that yes, not just the first year? Correct. And so these were programmed increases, if you will, when we originally signed the contract that were following through on? Correct. <coughs> Thanks. Anyone from Yes, Mark. Um, since you, you brought it up, can you go back one slide? The fiscal 18, the electricity cost um, jumped, right? So 530 is the actual 630 budget. So two questions. One, why? And two, looking at the actual where we are now, are we on track for that 630? So the electricity is 531 here at 17. Right. Yep. Then we budgeted 630, which is like a 20% jump. I wonder why. And then the second question is, are we given this at 193 through which? Which? What? Which, I could, uh, Kevin, we're tracking. We're on track right now, right? For electricity? Um, a lot of it has to do with rentals in the buildings. A lot of it has to do with increased facilities rentals and increased use. And I can tell you that um, on the school side, we the, the, the buildings are in use almost every day of the week. And even on the town side now, they've seen an uptick with renting uh, the senior center and using that facility as well as the police station. Increased calls by the PD, increased calls by the fire department, it's all. But on the school side, you're looking at a lot of rentals. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Paul. Yes, I also want to follow up on contract services. So, the whole contract was structured to do that, to have a big increase in third year? It was a, it's a, it's a, it's a three-year contract and it's renewed yearly. We have to get approval for the yearly renewal and it's obviously a funding is available. So yeah, there was increases every year in the contract. In the total dollar value of the contract it for the three years is what gets approved Correct. upon the initial. Right, so three years ago we knew in the third year we'd have this kind of increase? Yes. So, so almost a whole new, yeah, yes. yes. And this is the area, isn't it, that we went to every other day cleaning? Oh, by the way, I think if you click ignore, it stops. Because, right, new computers yeah, start there's, doing that. Yeah. Oh. No, we're not. <laughs> the high school. <laughs> Thanks for being here. She would like to volunteer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Help yeah. Us. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, we're doing, we're doing nightly duty. cleaning. Right, I remember last year, didn't we decrease because we were going to do every, am I crazy? I thought I remembered last year we had decrease in the budget because we were going to do 
less cleanings, and we knew. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, we did go back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. What did we but do? But we're going to do every other day cleaning, so we were going to live with having a little. There was there were some areas we had to shift to our custodial staff. That is okay. Perfect. All right. I'm sorry. All right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so some of the stuff oh, got shifted please. off the cleaning contractor onto our staff. Yes, in the building. It's, I wouldn't say it's every other day cleaning because some stuff has to get hit every day. But yeah, we did but shift some of the responsibilities, house. like the field house swung back over to us. Um, what else, Kev? What else did we... Right, because we actually saw a decrease in year yeah. two, right? We took on the field house for the most part. All, all of the field houses are taking the classes that are in, mm -hmm. in house right now. Um, the ride preschool at the high school has been taken on by the So are we shifting uh, back away from that? There's been a reduction in the um, contract cleaning staff as well. The team is not a person team that was here before. Now there are four or five people in line depending on the day. So we're we proposing next year to go, we go back, to the full back to the full. So the, the, the hope last year of being able to absorb some of that probably didn't work out as well as we'd hoped. I don't want to say it as well as we go, but sort of what we this is the same as this year. Okay. It's, a, it's a combination of looking at the mic. best allocation yeah. of the resources as well as having some of the menu options where we can determine which services are in and out, but th th there's only certain pieces that we yeah, can, that, that we have that flexibility yeah. Yeah, just on. Remember last yep. year, that was one of the decreases. So, oh, you know, we're going into this high level, and we're going to not. Yeah, th this again. third year was always in the contract at this amount. That, that, that hasn't changed. What we can no longer have, we don't have any more staff to be able to take over some of the things that we were able to do this year. Because we only have so many custodians in-house. And so now they're at their max capacity. We can't do anything more. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Is there any? Thanks. Uh, this is part of my learning curve, I'm sure. So we were talking about um, the rentals of the schools going up. So is there any kind of offset um, that's that we can take from that rental? We do take an offset where we do look at um, the fee that we're charging. Mm -hmm. covers that we do take an offset for the custodian staff that goes through we've also looked at our rental rates we looked at this last year and we are very competitive so we do not feel we have a lot of flexibility to increase the rates that we're charging but we do continuously assess it and when we revisit next year as well we'll continue so to look at it so we take an offset yeah. in the um custodial but what about for there is an offset for the town as well we there do is, there this? is a portion okay. right. it's not shown it's not showing on here, right? here but there is an offset from our extended day as well as our use of school properties that goes directly to the town to cover it's utility. this piece it's of in the utility, the utility <laughs> piece so we do have that built in we do okay yes, we thank do. you Mary do you have a question um, no, I don't. What was the last time we did look at these? We looked at them last year as part of this process and did determine that we were very competitive. We also will be doing another look at it this year because we also want to ensure that we are not, you cannot charge a rate more than what it's costing you to run the program. So similar to the discussion we had with Extended Day where we actually now are reducing the rates we're charging, we have to be very careful that we don't overcharge for what we're doing. Okay, we get capital. Okay. So the first part, um, this is more than I thought. So this is the current projected um, capital that is the same numbers that were in the capital plan that was presented um, as part of, I believe, the Board of Selectmen meeting, <coughs> as well as what was done 
um, earlier in the year. So I will let Joe talk about the facility side and then we can briefly mention um, the school side, which is infrastructure related. Okay, so um, under, I'm just going to go on the detail. Yeah. So we've got uh, money at the Coolidge Middle School, uh, $30,000. That's to replace uh, some exhaust fans on the roof of that building over there, which is something that you're going to see that in the capital plan just about every year. Uh, and a couple of split systems over at that location. It's under HVAC. At the high school, the $575,000 is to replace the uh, Cleaver Brooks boiler that was removed from the old Reading High School and converted from steam to hydronic, which was, a, and it was oil, and now it's natural gas. Um, it was not replaced as part of the building project, and we are targeting that to replace it with some condensing boilers. Um, we're in the process of having a design done on that, and that'll be, that capital will be available in July. At Birch Meadow, we have uh, some money in there for windows and door, re it's going to be doors we do over there, exterior doors on the building, and it also at the Joshua E, some exterior doors over at that facility. Parker Middle School, uh, $15,000 has been allocated for some flooring. We're more than likely going to do some more classrooms. We did five last year. We're going to uh, hit a bunch again this summer. And at the high school, we've got some money in the um, capital plan, $40,000 for carpet replacement, which we're targeting the distance learning center and some other rooms that are carpeted in the high school. And that makes up the whole city. Any questions? Mark. What is the, the wind um, skylight project? Is that this year? This That's year? in the okay. FY18. Yeah, the wind end is in this year. And we're, the bids are going to be, we're going to be getting bids back on that on the 17th, and we should have an award by uh, February 8th. So, not to, to muddy the waters, but uh, on that five, the $575,000 boiler, Mm -hmm. uh, is that if we had any discussions about a capital exclusion for that? I mean, that's that's a big number to just flow through the regular. You can do a capital exclusion. It currently fits. I don't know. Is it, that's up to the finance committee, right? Is that what it is now? Yes, sir. So I know there's been a lot of questions about Kellum. Uh, we actually had a conversation. Oh, you, you don't need to leave. You can sit right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Joe. Joe. Thank you. Uh, so we presented a lot of this at the Board of Selectments meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a couple of new pieces that we just want to add, some additional research that we've done. So a lot of this you've already heard. I've actually, I think I've said it twice at school committee meetings and once at a board of selectmen's meeting. Uh, so you can see in Killam the work that's been performed. Killam is a very structurally sound building, and I think we need to understand that. that um, and from an educational standpoint, it's providing um, the space and the technology needs that, that we need to educate our students. Um, but it, is, it was built in 1969, and so it, does, it is showing some wear and tear in certain areas. Some of the systems need to be updated. But there's been a lot of work done at Killam as well. And, um, the HVAC work, and the roof, new clear story windows, new fire alarm panel, uh, updated technology wireless infrastructure, and that's going to be done by the end of the year. Um, the things that need to be done at Killam um, are certainly the handicap accessibility. ADA laws were not um, as, um, as strict in 1969 as certainly they are now. Um, and so, you know, those are certainly areas that need to be addressed in the bathrooms, the library, the high D areas. Uh, Killam does not have a fire suppression system, but we also have a couple other schools that do not have fully sprinkled buildings as well, and that's important to know that Killam is not the only school. And it really is when the building came online 
is when the fire suppression system was, was put in. Um, and as I mentioned at a meeting that we had here at the school committee, um, having the new fire alarm panel is something that is actually at more important because that'll, that notifies people that are in the building if there is a fire and so that they can get out of the building. So the fire alarm panel saves people, whereas the fire suppression system uh, saves property. So there's a, there's a difference there. Um, the biggest issue, obviously, that we're currently mitigating is the lead in the water. Um, then you have also classroom doors and windows. There's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in those areas uh, because a lot of the classrooms do go out. They have doors that go to the outside. And then we have the general just updating the systems themselves, the heat and the electrical. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because we've looked at this before, the, the MSBA report. So Killam did receive a rating of one, which was the highest score for general environment conditions. All of those things that are listed under that bullet uh, fit the general environment conditions ranging from the learning environment all the way to the uh, Wi-Fi access, power infrastructure, uh, those types of things. Where Killam did fall was a rating of three out of four on building condition rating. Uh, and the criteria for this is more of the roofing, the exterior windows, boilers, HVAC, those types of things, which we do know have not been replaced. I mentioned that in the earlier slide. Um, and those are certainly in some of the outside site work as well. <clears throat> so that's clearly an area that work would need to be done. In some further analysis, when we were looking at the MSBA funding, because we were not prepared at the selectmen's meeting to talk about the MSBA funding process, uh, the one piece I did talk about is MSBA puts every single school that applies on a priority list. And so the bullets that are listed here are, are what, what puts certain schools above other schools. Um, and you can see structurally unsound or otherwise in serious condition. Uh, jeopardizing health and safety. This is an immediate health and safety issue is this category. Um, overcrowding, loss of accreditation, uh, replacement modernization of heating system, which is more of the accelerated repair program and not uh, the, the full-blown renovation or addition, uh, new, new structure. Short-term enrollment growth, uh, replacing or adding to obsolete buildings or to address racial imbalance. And so those are all areas that would, that would put schools at a higher priority over other schools. Now the important part about this, and I think this is the new piece, is that the, the statement of interest piece, which actually opened up Friday, uh, MSBA is not gonna put a school on the funding list unless the community has made a commitment to fund the project. So what does that look like? Uh, that needs to be a commitment from the community, either a debt exclusion override, uh, or some other means that would show that the community is going to make the funding commitment if MSBA approves the process. And that needs to be done um, within a two year span. So we would need to be guaranteed today, if we were going to apply, we would need to be guaranteed today that, that within two years, the town would support a debt exclusion override for killing. Uh, which I don't think we can at this point. We can't do that. So. If we were to go down this route, we would, as we suggested before, we would uh, certainly want to do some sort of feasibility study first to see what what the areas are that we need to take a look at. That is certainly a school committee driven decision, um, and there would need to be a lot more discussion on that by the by the school committee. Um, and so, it, so th those are really the criteria. If we were to get put on the list and we were to get prioritized to receive funding for a certain year we would receive a reimbursement of about 48%. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but approximately that would be the amount that we would receive. Just a quick question. I'm sort of recalling that, that the previous percentage was higher on the other projects. Our, our previous yeah, they've changed the whole funding. Board. That was when it was under a different, yeah, different uh, rules. A different agency. Mm -hmm. MSBA has changed since then. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I would just say the, the other difference from the last time we did the Wood End High School and Barrows 
um, was that at that time the school committee we did not have the support and expertise of a building committee so this whole process is something that the school committee would would begin to execute and would be working with the town building committee which is great right. that that's a resource because it was a huge thing to do when we did those three projects just through the committee <laughs> Did you have, a, I have no. something on? I wanted to jump back to the other part of the presentation on that boiler. Uh, oh. I mean, this is the first I've heard. Am I missing? When did we talk about a, a 500 and some odd thousand dollar? I mean, the boiler has been in the capital. And plan can that be delayed? Uh, can it be delayed any longer, or is it? I mean, so I think what's important is that this is capital funding. So if we did not, if the money didn't get purposed for a boiler, it would get purposed for another capital item. Right. Okay. It wouldn't be something that could get transferred to an operating budget. Okay. The, bo the boiler is, is about is, is about 25 years old. It was not maintained while well. we did not have a water treatment program, and that boiler was running in the old building. So there's a member that last year alone we replaced six tubes in the boiler and it cost us around eight thousand bucks. So it's about to come eight thousand dollars. So um, it runs fine. I mean it'll run the whole building up during this during the cold snap we just had boiler two was the one running the whole building. We have two boilers, it's for redundancy, so one goes down and the other one takes over. Mm -hmm. It runs fine. It could last five more years or it could it could go any time now, but um, we're seeing things with it that are not pleasing, so that's why we're talking for replacement because it makes good sense to do that, and also because the condensing boilers are much more efficient, and that's what we're going to replace them with. Condensing three condensing boilers that will be the size of each one of those tables. What's in there right now is, is enormous. Um, it'll save a ton of energy. So that's what we're looking to do. Um, I, I don't know. I wish I knew. We replaced a lot of the tubes last year. That was a big expense. And the year before that, we did some also. Gee, I mean, to your point, I understand what you're saying, but it could find its way back. Yes, it could. It could, yeah. yes. So I understand. I just didn't want yeah. people to think, oh, we can just yeah. take this but easily But it transfer. would free up <coughs> working, you know, I don't, not to use the same working capital for something else. Yes. Feels weird speaking into a microphone, looking right at you. Um, I have a question on the MSBA funding. So one of the criteria to, for them to consider funding a project is to replace or add to obsolete buildings in order to provide a full range of programs. Did they only look at that on a school by school basis? So is this school adequate for all of the programs in the district, or could they take a district wide approach? What I'm particularly thinking in the future is the modulars. We have modulars at three buildings, which we're <coughs> going to need to a plan to address over time. They're not permanent, permanent structures the way a building is. Can can we look can we combine the Killam project at some point with that? Or, or are they gonna say I only look building by building? Oh, sorry. That's a good question. Uh, you could, we could certainly look at it more of a system-wide approach. A lot of it, it, they have an available amount of funding each year, and it all depends on the number of schools that apply each year, and the schools, how needy are they above kill. So that's really what it would come down to. Um, but that certainly is a strategy that you, we could use um, when we are ready to do that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, fair. Um, I'll just can I do it from here. Sure. So, John, you said that before we even get looked at, that the town has to make a commitment to its share of the funding. The project. So, does that mean that just trying to think, you know, A and B and C? A, you guys have to decide what you want to do, right? You're going to bring in the <coughs> permanent building committee. You're going to get a scope of, you know, whether it's going to be a new building or or whatever, it's going to have some type of a detailed cost estimate now that we have a permanent building that can actually do that, right? Then it's going to go to town meeting, right? Um, for basically a discussion and then potentially to the voters. And, and that's without a commitment from the state that they're going to do. So we can actually go and say, okay, this is what we want to do, this is what we think it's going to cost, this is going to be our commitment, 
um, town, do you want to do this? We could vote yes, and then go to the back to the SBA, and they said, well, no, sorry, you're not on the list. And we've gone through that process mm -hmm. and basically kind of got people all excited for a project that's So happening. my understanding is that you have to, you have to no. commit the full amount of funding, full. assuming you're not going to get the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what we did for the library. So you have to assume it's that, that did let's, say, let's say it's yeah. $30 million. I have no idea. But if it's $30 million, the town would need to commit $30 million. And then you get you do the statement of interest, MSBA puts you on the list, and then you could we get the We didn't get this building until, uh, a commitment for this building until the, the override passed for it, right? Right, that is correct. So is there any indication? I mean, is there, I mean, I think yeah. to go through that process, right, where you take up a lot of the school community. Obviously, it's yeah. got to get done. Right. You go through that process. You get people involved. You spend a lot of oxygen and, and energy. Folks in the Cone neighborhood get really excited about it, and then you know we go and say, okay, we're in, right? And then they say, well, that's great, but you know, it's all on you now. But they, but I, I just before I, we go too far down this, we wanted to provide an update to provide clarity. People should really, honestly, not be focused on this right now. We have an operating problem that is incredibly critical. And I, my kids went to the Killam School. I understand it. I was on this committee for all of the building projects. I understand what this takes. But right now, unless we can fix what's going on inside the buildings, and so I just want, I just really want people to focus on that. I don't want people to think that the committee is not committed to looking at what we need to do. But you can see it's going to take a number of years. Because the, as you know, like you, you do feas feasibility studies, you do a design study. We have to look at the whole system. Jean brought up the modules. There's other things that we would need to look at, you know, whether it be full day K, you know, the dreams we have of tuition free full day K for all. Like, you know, that's been a 10 year dream. Well, if we're going to do something, a big building project, we're going to have to address a lot of different issues. So it's going to take a number of years. The commitment, I, I thought that there was, in some cases, you could have a commitment, whether it's a town meeting or it has to be the actual vote. In the past, it's been the actual override be, vote to the, the debt. Vote. Right. approved before you get any and we we're done with this discussion right I mean that was the update uh, yeah I just wanted because the, the piece that we did not tell the committee or the board of selectmen or the community the last time was the funding process and I wanted the community to know that the community would need to make a commitment before we could even apply for a statement of interest John did you just uh, that's an aha moment for me as well uh, I guess what that means the Barry's point is you actually have to scope the entirety of the project, the number of rooms, the footprint, the, the entire building uh, process before you even get to page one, step one on this page. Right. You, you need to do a full feasibility study. To design get study. To even design it. study, really. It's a feasibility <coughs> and then a design study. You know, in, our, in our meeting, some of the killing parents were pretty animated about it. Uh, even though it's not a focus of tonight, I think it's helpful to have this up to the spot mm -hmm. there with other anchors. And I did like to tell the wall, so I remember. I wanted to clarify the process because I think I heard two things that the community has to commit to funding the project before uh, the town can apply. But I thought I also heard that the, the, there has to be a commitment within two years of the application. Which, which one? Both. No, to fund the project in the next two years. So we have to make. We would have to make a commitment. If we would apply today. We would need to know that they would be a commitment to funding within two years. As in, the, 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 no, that the vote. The no. vote has happened, and the funding is committed <coughs> to happen in the next two years. The last vote, and that's the why we filed the required votes for the governing bodies. So you'd have to have had the debt exclusion override, had it passed with the plan that that's going to be done in the next two years. But you have to have the override debt exclusion passed. Thank you. Any other? I just have. Yep. Can I just? Um, I, not to belabor this, but I am noticing that one of the pieces of work that has to be done is addressing the handicapped accessibility. Is that, does that put us in any kind of liability or risk or anything, not having that up to 
No. No. Uh, no. And Jill, Jill has been we, a big part of that. <laughs> we address the issues when, they, when we need to. Okay. Thank um, you. It, it's not been, it's, it's mostly, honestly, it's mostly the bathrooms the mm -hmm. and the library the area yep. are the biggest. I mean, if you ever see the bathrooms at Kelly, they're very tiny. They're not wheelchair accessible. So we've had to do some more grounds on that. But we, if we have to address it, we do address it. The problem is if you put too much improvement, capital improvement at one time, it triggers other laws and, yeah. and things that we have to do, and that creates a bigger expense. Thank you. That actually is the last section that we yeah. were covering for yeah. this evening. So those are our prepared remarks. Okay. So on Wednesday night, we'll be doing the two large class centers, regular day and special education. Oh, uh, Linda, Linda, did you have a report? Yes, I just wanted to. Thank you. We don't have an, a human relations advisory committee liaison yet. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that the Martin Luther King Day celebration is this coming Monday. That's um, January 15th from 9.30 to 11.30. It's fun. It's free. It's important. Um, there'll be community tables there. Honeydew Donuts is again supporting us. So there will be delicious donuts. Um, <laughs> And we have a uh, Friends of Metco chorus this year of 24 children. Yay. So it's really a feat. Um, it's wonderful. And so I wanted to make sure everybody knew so you'd come. Bring your kids, bring your families. Oh, I, it would be at the, um, <laughs> the PAC, the Performing Arts Center at the high school. Um, and the tables will be along the main street inside the high school and then we'll go in for the program inside the auditorium. And we are going to have drama kids doing um, work, poetry and performance and we'll also have music It'll, from the community, from community organizations. And thank you to everybody that has helped with it. Quick, just so along those lines, there's also Saturday is like a day of community service. I don't really actually have a lot of the details, but I know Redding things cares. going on at Old South, Reading Cares. Redding cares yep. Look, go on the town website or something and look it up. But there's a lot going on on Saturday that yep. they're looking for a whole host of volunteers for a bunch of different activities um, that are basically great service beyond self type of things. And another meeting to put in your calendar is January 18th. There'll be a Reading Embraces Diversity meeting. There'll be more information on that. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming tonight. We appreciate uh, the participation. And again, uh, we're here uh, Wednesday night and Thursday, at, and Thursday night at uh, 7, 8, 7 p.m. <laughs> We usually say And I am. Oh. <laughs> uh, so thanks again, and we'll see you. Oh, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn. Good night.